to welcome those who are watching online. We're just uh, welcoming you to the service today. And uh, we're going to be speaking on walking in the supernatural and give some practical keys and also challenge us to live a life bigger and better and more powerful than the one we've lived. Amen? Amen. And uh, the teaching I'm giving today, I'd be normally giving in the, in the apostolic school, but I'll be away. We're heading off uh, uh, tomorrow morning, very early, 6.30, uh, to do ministry in Australia and various other places. So uh, just pray for us in that season away. And uh, I want to share this message now. It's going to help us. So if we start off in Psalm uh, 8, Psalm 8, Psalm 8. And uh, I want to read for, in verse 4 through to around about verse 6. What is man that you're mindful of him? And the son of man that you visit him. In other words, the psalmist is saying, I'm amazed God is so interested in us. For you have made him a little lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor. You have made him to have dominion over the works of his hands. You put all things under his feet. So the psalmist is explaining that when God made us, his original intention was we would be his representatives in the earth. God didn't make us just to fill in our life and be busy doing trivia. God made us purposefully and designed or intended that you and I would represent Him. That means that in the affairs of the earth, we're called to represent the living God. We're called to express the heart of God in the earth. A lot of people say, well, you know, if there's so much trouble in the earth, where is God and all this? The answer is really very, very simple to that. God entrusted the earth to man If we've messed it up, it's because we messed it up, not because he failed in any way. We were delegated the responsibility for governance and for extending his kingdom. We were given the responsibility to bring the realm of kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, into the earth. That's God's original design. He has never changed. When man failed, sin into the world, demonic oppression into the world, sickness, wars, striving, today there are problems that can't be answered except by the power of God. People need miracles. People with a broken heart need healing. People with physical bodies need healing. There are sicknesses need the power of God to heal them. There are people struggling with impossible situations in marriage and family and finances and life. They need God's power to manifest to help them. And this has all been a consequence of the fall. So let's just talk a little bit about the supernatural. And I want to bring some challenges and yet end up with something quite practical. First of all, when we ask, what is the supernatural? What are we referring to? There is a natural realm. The natural realm concerns the physical world we live in. We have five senses. You can interact with the physical world. If you lose any one of those senses, your experience of the physical world diminishes immensely. So the physical world is a world we live in, a world unique to man, a world God designed us to live in and interact with. And so we have physical senses enabling us to interact with a, with a realm. And the realm of the, the physical world is governed by laws. There are laws govern space, laws govern time, laws govern matter. The laws of physics govern the world that we're in. So there are laws that govern and control how the natural realm works. But there's also a supernatural realm. What does supernatural mean? Supernatural means above and beyond the natural. When the Bible talks about the supernatural realm, it's talking to the invisible realm of the Spirit. So we have a natural realm. We see, we enter into it with our five natural senses. But there's a spiritual realm. The Bible tells us that the spiritual realm is eternal. The natural realm is limited, is governed by time, but the spiritual realm or the realm of the Spirit is eternal. It is timeless. The realm of the Spirit is the realm from which this earth came into being. Therefore, it is a superior realm. Now, we're used to living in the physical world, so therefore, the realm of the Spirit seems strange, seems unusual, seems like, well, that's for sort of weird sort of people. That is a mindset that needs to be changed. You and I are designed completely uniquely. We're designed to be a spirit being living in a body. Therefore, With senses, we can interact with the physical world. With our spirit, we can enter the realm of the supernatural and experience God. We enter that realm by faith. Without faith, you can't connect with and interact with the realm of the supernatural. So your experience of the supernatural dimension of God reflects 
the level of faith you live and walk in. No supernatural, very little faith. Come on, think about it. See, otherwise, you get into this thing, well, God doesn't want to do these things. God doesn't uh, uh, want to do miracles. God doesn't want to intervene in my life. You see, what happens is because we have a mindset set against the things of the Spirit, we then limit what God can do. God has designed us so we can access His blessings by faith. By faith, we have access. So it's from your spirit that you gain access to the things of the supernatural realm. Now, when you look in the Bible, you find everywhere in the Bible, God is a supernatural God. Think about this. Do you want to serve a God that's not supernatural? What kind of sense would it make to serve a God who wasn't above and beyond the natural realm? He couldn't intervene. That would be a dumb sort of God to serve, wouldn't it? Why would you want to serve someone who didn't have the power to intervene and change the natural realm? And so all through the Bible, we find from one end to the other, we find God is a supernatural God, and because He is above and beyond the natural, He can intervene in the natural. So you start to look through the Bible, and you see right through the Bible, you see God intervening, spectacular interventions. Uh, I mean, you, you, sometimes you read it and just get used to it rather than stopping to think, wow, that is something else. Can you imagine all the people at Babel and they're all talking one language and then God intervenes to bring judgment and now no one can talk to one another. That's extraordinary. That's extraordinary. Or can you see that a nation, like a, a powerful nation such as Egypt with a whole, uh, a whole uh, millions of slaves and they are forced by the power of God to release all the slaves to the purpose of God. That is unbelievable. That is like an amazing thing. Amazing that God would do such a thing. And they came and faced an impossible circumstance, water that was in front, mountains beside, an enemy beyond, and then God opens the water and they walk through. That is amazing. They walk through a desert. There's no animals. There's no food. There's nothing there. But every day, God provides from heaven. All through the Bible, you see the walls of Jericho, massive impenetrable, massive walls. You could drive two chariots around them. It was that big and that powerful, and yet the power of God came, broke it all down, all through the Bible. This is the God we serve, a supernatural God, a powerful God. He's not weak. He's not impotent. He's not feeble. He's not wringing his hands. He is a God of power, a God of might. The Bible says he's a man of war, a mighty, valiant God. Don't forget who he is. Don't let your concept of God Drop down to your experience. Keep in the Word to keep your faith up about who our God is that we serve. We see Him raising the dead to life through the Old Testament. We see Him multiplying a small amount of food so that it lasts for a whole year. We see God doing all kinds of extraordinary miracles. We see kingdoms being conquered by men who believe God. That's the God of the Old Testament. What a great God. Come on, let's give the Lord a clap. That's an exciting God. That's our God. That's our Father. That's the God we serve, not some powerless, lifeless God. And then we have a look. And the Bible tells us concerning Jesus Christ, Hebrews 1, it tells us in verse 3, He is the express image of the living God. He is the express revelation of God as a loving Father. Now, if God is a supernatural God, what would you expect in the ministry of Jesus? See, if God is supernatural and God brought Jesus into this world to represent Him fully, you would expect what? You would expect miracles. Yes. You would expect miracles. In fact, if Jesus is the express image of God and there's no miracles, I'd start to doubt about the God we're serving. And so when you look at Jesus' life and ministry, how did he get conceived? A supernatural intervention of God. How did he get saved? Supernatural intervention of God. He went out as a young child. When the persecution came, his his father was warned to flee. We find through his ministry, oh, the mighty miracles. Oh, can you imagine being at a wedding? And Jesus says, fill all those huge vats with water, and they all get changed to wine. That is stunning. You could make some money if you could do that today, couldn't you, eh? And it's not just old crappy wine, it's good wine, eh? The best wine. eh? And you see these miracles. You know, the bread, loaves and fishes multiplied to feed thousands. 
We see a cripple healed. We see lepers healed. We see blind people healed. We see lame people healed. We see every kind of miracle. We see people being delivered from evil spirits. All through Jesus' ministry, the supernatural is evident. This is who we serve. This is the God we serve, a God who's extraordinary. Do not limit him to the natural. Do not limit him to what you've experienced in the past. God is above and beyond that. He is bigger than that. He is a supernatural God. And he made us to live and walk in that supernatural realm. Think about this. We're going to get to this in a moment. If you've come to agree our God is supernatural, and that when God sent His Son to represent Him, His Son operated and moved in the supernatural. You have to come to the conclusion that we also are designed to walk in the supernatural. If we are going to represent who God is, if we're going to represent what He is like to the world, don't represent a powerless God. We need a God of power, a God who miracles, a God who does supernatural things. Amen? So the purpose of the supernatural is twofold. Number one, it's to reveal our God. It's to reveal God is a Father who loves people. Secondly, it's to meet the needs of people. People have needs. You can't meet unless God touches them. Think of your own life. Think of your testimonies. Think of how God helped you. It was impossible. Then God did it, and now here you are, and your life has been transformed. That's how it is. So Jesus commissioned the church to continue what he began. See, many people consider that after Jesus died and rose from the dead, that was the end of all the supernatural. Some people have a doctrinal position. Notice what it says in Acts chapter 1 and verse 1. Acts chapter 1 and verse 1. What do you read what it says there in the first verse? These are the works, these are the things. He says, the former account I made, Theophilus, of all that Jesus began to do and to teach. In other words, what he's saying these are the things that Jesus began to do. Now, if you begin something, you must finish what you began. If you've begun to speak and to do things, you should finish what you've begun. You know, no one's happy with someone who doesn't, who's not a finisher, doesn't finish what they've begun. So Jesus began. So when, when it says he began, well, then what happens now? Well, the book of Acts is a, trans, a transition book. It's a transition between Jesus himself doing the works and now delegating those works to someone else to do those works. Jesus began the works. Someone else must continue those works. Someone else is called to continue the works that he began. And so they raise the question, well, who's called to continue those works? There's just a few special people. Well, let me give you two or three things. Number one, Jesus trained and commissioned his disciples for supernatural ministry. So Matthew 10, verse 1, it says, He gave them authority and power to cast out demons and heal sicknesses. So Jesus, from the very beginning of his ministry, planned that what he did would be replicated in other people. Cast out demons, heal the broken heart, uh, heal the sick, bring the gospel to people. Jesus' intention, he trained them that they would do that. Not only that, commission and release them and authorize them to do that. Here's the second thing. All believers are called to continue the works that Jesus began. John 14, verse 12, the works I do, you shall do also. He that believes on me. He didn't say just the apostles. He said whoever believes on Jesus, that means there's faith involved. He will do the similar works. So God's intention is that we would be activated to do similar works to what Jesus did. Here's another thing. Uh, number three, all believers are mandated to advance the kingdom with supernatural power. Look what it tells us in the mandate given to the church in Mark chapter 16. Mark 16. We read in Mark 16, he says, now what he's, he's the man, now we call this the Great Commission. That's what it says. Verse 15, go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. How many understand that wasn't just given to the apostles, it's given to the whole church? How many understand the instruction, the mandate, not the suggestion, the mandate Jesus gave his church, go. Go everywhere. Wherever you go, what should you do? Share and testify and proclaim the gospel of the kingdom. And then he said, and these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name, they'll cast out demons, they'll lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. They'll do many supernatural works. You read the last verse in Mark 
chapter 16, it says, and as they went out everywhere proclaiming the kingdom, God worked with them doing miracles, signs, and wonders. So if we're not seeing and experiencing the supernatural, something's lacking in our journey that we need to pursue God to do something about. It requires a pursuit of God for this to happen. I'm going to show you another verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Look at this. Look at this. This makes it so clear. There's, if you just look at the, the God is a supernatural God all through the Old Testament, God did stuff. He did supernatural things through people. Then God raises up Jesus, does something supernatural right through his life. Jesus prepared others to carry on the supernatural. Now look what it tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1. Now concerning spirituals or moving in the supernatural, brethren, I don't want you to be ignorant. In other words, he's saying you need to learn. We need to learn how to operate supernaturally. It's not something you know naturally. It's something that comes by revelation, comes by instruction, comes by people helping us grow in that area. We have to learn it. You know, like you learn maths. You just go into school and there's that hard stuff, and eventually if you apply yourself, uh, frequently you can learn it. Some people have a real trouble with that one. But notice that there's something we can learn. In other words, to live in the supernatural, we are designed for it, and can learn how to function. Notice what he says here in verse 7. Now the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. Let's just pull that apart. The manifestation of the Spirit means a supernatural, clearly visible operation of God through a person. Words of information, knowledge, words of revelation, words of encouragement, words of prophecy, healings, discerning of spirits, operations that are designed to meet the needs of people. Every person, every believer, God wants to give it to you. This is, it's a clear, that, that verse is so, so clear that God's desire is to give this to you. And why does He want to give it to you? So that you can profit the body of people, that you can bring blessing to others. So the gifts of God are not given for you to enhance your reputation. The gifts of God are given to you so you can meet a need. Why? Because God wants to meet a need. And some can only be met by the power of God. They're just too hard. There's so many problems, there is no answer for them. It needs God to intervene. So what does God do? God says, well, I'll raise someone up and give them a gifting to bless and help that person lift them up out of that situation so that they profit or benefit. So here's the question. How many people are benefiting from you being a channel of God? See, it's, it's a very clear a very clear statement there. Not only that, all of us, all of us, all of us are called to be active in doing something to advance the kingdom of God. Let me show you another verse. Uh, uh, Titus, book of Titus. We're going to the book of Titus. We're going to the book of Titus, Timothy Titus. You find it there. Let's see if I can find it. Here it is, Titus. And I want to show you just from Titus and we look in chapter 2, verse 14. Chapter 2, Titus. Here it is, chapter 2 and verse 14. Now notice what it says. Jesus Christ, it says, He gave Himself for us that He might redeem us. So in other words, He saved us. Saved us from sin, saved us from eternal destruction, saved us from curses, saved us from demonic spirit, redeemed us from every lawless deal to purify for Himself His own special people, zealous for good works. That word special or peculiar, is, it means beyond ordinary. Huh? It mean, it's, it's a word meaning to be above and beyond what is normal. Now how about that? So, so this is God's desire. When He redeemed you, He's not just to save you because He felt sorry for you. It's actually to fulfill the purpose He had for you, which is to reinstate you in sonship, so you can reflect your Father and advance His kingdom. So He called or redeemed us, and now He purifies us. That means He gets rid of the baggage in our life that hinders us. Why? So we can be a special people, above and beyond people, an unusual people, 
a unique people, someone different. In what way are we different? We are zealous or passionate for good works. Zealous and passionate to do something for God. Zealous and passionate to do something to advance the kingdom of God. Zealous, that means burning with something. See? In Titus, in chapter 3, he says, I encourage you and teach you and exhort you and remind you, everyone should be diligent to maintain good works. Now, I want you just to think about this. What have you done to intentionally advance the kingdom of God in the last week? How zealous are you that the name of God be known? How zealous are you to do something that brings blessing and benefit, encouragement, and a lifting up to someone else? Or do we have to look at it and say, something's missing here. Something's missing inside me. The passion's not there. The fire's not there. I'm not functioning like God wanted me to function. Remember, God's intention is that we function this way, zealous to do things that advance the kingdom of God and make Him known. You're getting quiet now. But this is, this is God's intention. This is God's intention. Sin, we tend to think of sin as being bad stuff, but we don't think of sin as all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. In other words, sin is I'm falling short of what God intended for me. This is what He intends for us. Let's pursue it. Okay, so let's ask the question then. How does God work or minister or operate in the supernatural today? How does Jesus operate in the supernatural today? So let's have a look at the first thing. When God wanted to operate supernaturally in the earth, you know what He did? He caused His Son to be born in and have a physical body in the earth. Why is that? Why couldn't He just come as a spirit thing and just sort of like a ghost, just turn up here and there and make Himself known? Well, that takes us back to the very, very first verse we looked at that God gave man dominion over the earth. So if God is going to work in the earth, He always works through a person. We saw with prayer that God has limited Himself to work through the person He has authorized on the earth, man. So we wonder why nothing happens. It's because God has limited Himself to work through people, people of faith, people available, people committed, people willing to give themselves to Him. That's how He's chosen to work. So how does God bring salvation into the earth? He brings it in through a man. Jesus had to be born into a physical body. In Hebrews 10, it tells us, it says, Lo, a body you have prepared for me. Lo, I have come to do your will. So Jesus came from heaven, letting go all His power, all His authority, all His rights, born into a physical body. Why? So he could reflect, this is what God is like. This is what God has intended. This is what we're called to be, this kind of person. Oh, you're getting so quiet now. You have prepared a body for me. Lo, I delight to do you well. He said, you're not interested in sacrifices. You're not interested in offerings. This is what you want. You want a person you can work through. Now, you see, a lot of people get hung up in the sacrifices, offerings, all that kind of thing. Old Testament was full of it, but that was never the heart of God. This is always what the heart of God has been. I just want someone who will say yes to me, and yes every day, and yes in the little matters. I want a body I can express myself through having a loving relationship with that person. Say amen to that. Oh, it'll get real quiet now. Okay, then. So, so, so notice this, in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 21, 1 Corinthians 12, it talks about the body of Christ. So when, when I say the word body of Christ, what are we referring to? Hey, okay. We're referring to the, t to the church. See? So we read in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, it said we start in verse 12, now as the body is one and has many members, all the members of that one body being many are one, so is Christ, verse 12. So what he's saying is, your, your body, your physical body, has got many parts to it. And everyone is necessary, and they all need to work as one. And then it says, down in verse 21, the head can't say to the body, I don't need you. If you just had a head and no body, what kind of life are you going to live? And what, you know, and if you get itchy, then you're never going to scratch, because you've got no hands. 
See, if you've only got a head, you think about a physical body. If you've got a body and you, you can't control your hands, your hands just got their own mind, that we would call that massively dysfunctional, wouldn't we? Now, if you saw someone walking down the road and they sort of lost control of all their limbs like this, you say, whoa, that's a messed up person. They need healing. Something's really wrong. The body is not responding to the head. Well, it's the same with Christ. Christ the head has chosen to work through a body. In other words, we want God to change stuff. He says, I've chosen to do it through a body connected to me. So you want to see the supernatural? God's not going to suddenly do it. He will do it through people committed and connected to him. That's how a natural body works. That's how the spiritual body works. We have to understand that. God has chosen to work that way. Because he's chosen to work that way, we understand then we have a significant, important role. If God is going to do supernatural stuff, he will do it through people. He will do it through us. Okay? And so we are the house of God. We are the gateway to the supernatural. In Genesis, it tells us, uh, in the book of Genesis 20, 28 and verse 17, Jacob had a, a vision of, 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 uh, uh, of God. God came to him in a vision at night. And this is what he got. He got a revelation. He said, surely this is the house of God, the place where God's present is. And what else did he say? He calls it the gate to heaven. So in other words, every one of us individually is known as the house of God. The Spirit of God came to live inside you. He came to anoint you. He came to empower you to fulfill a mission. Not only that, if we are the house of God, we are also the gate to heaven. What is the gate? The gateway is through our spirit by faith. When God wants to do something, it flows from heaven through our spirit and must express through a body. Otherwise, it will never find its way into the earth. See, we get a religious mindset of waiting for God to do everything and fail to understand that God has chosen to participate with people. We must get involved. Lavina, come on up quickly. Just come up quickly. I'll just show what I mean. Just come, just put your hand on my hand for a moment. Just stand there. Close your eyes for just a moment. Now, we are made to be the gate of heaven. That means in our spirit connected to God, we can just open up our spirit and the power of God will just come. Just like that. You understand, we are to be a gate for God to work through. Now, God wanted to touch her, but how did he do it? He worked through someone that said yes. It's always that way. <laughs> you want some more? <laughs> Here it comes. Pow, comes. So, so when God wants to touch someone, just stay there because you're going to start to encounter him. When God wants to touch someone's life, he does it through a person. Or he does it directly to us as we, by faith, engage him. So it's both ways. We engage God and he touches our life. Then he uses the touch life to engage and bring his presence to others. So literally, you are a house, a container, a temple of God, and also a gate for God's blessings to benefit others. Everywhere you go, no matter what job you have, you can be in school, you are still the house of God, the gate of heaven. You're in a workplace, you're still the house of God, the gate of heaven. Now, when we get this revelation, I am called to become full of God and be a gateway of blessing. Whew, give him more, Lord. See, we're to be called to be a, a gate of blessing. See? <laughs> So notice in 1 Corinthians 3, 9, it says we are co-laborers with God. We work with Him. So it's not like we're going to run around and be busy doing everything and this and that. You'll just burn yourself out. Rather, we work with God. God works through us. We work with Him. That means you need a relationship to find out what actually He wants you to do. There's too many needs for you to meet. If you try to meet them all, you'll burn out. You'll have a breakdown. It's hopeless. And I see many people get caught up in that. But we are called to do the things God shows us to do. So Jesus said, the works I do, he said, the Father does them through me. And he says, I do what I see the Father doing. In other words, out of relationship, he manifested 
the love and the power of God to meet needs. That's how it works. Not every need. I mean, you think about in Acts 3, Peter and John came in through the, the, to the gate of the temple. There's a man there who was crippled. He must have been there all the time Jesus was coming in and out of the temple. Jesus never met that man's need right at that time. He had ordained that Peter and John would meet that need. There are needs in this community, and God has ordained you would be the channel to meet that need. There's some people in this community that only you can meet their need. God has sent you, assigned you there. We think, well, I wish I was in Gold Coast. No, 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 you'd be the same person in Gold Coast. If you're a selfish person here, you'll be a selfish person there. If you're a faithful person here, you'll be a faithful person there. If you're, uh, if you're all wound up in your own cares and, and too busy for God, you'll be too busy for God there. It won't make any difference taking you somewhere else. You are you, you'll be you wherever you are. So if you're kind here, you'll be kind there. Most people say, God, get me out of here, get me a better place. No, he said, I want to change you and make you a different person. So, what, so, see, the thing is, if we are his body to work with him, then we must cooperate with the head. That means you need to submit to the head. You need to be committed that what the Father shows me, I will do it. So what has he told us to do? He's told us to preach the gospel, share the good news of Jesus Christ. He's told us to testify about the goodness of God. He's told us to pray for sick people. He told us to heal the brokenhearted. He told us to cast demons out. He told us to visit people. We are told to meet the needs of people. That's God's plan. There's no plan too. What happens is Christians get this thing by just getting in a room and praying, I've got to do it all. Well, sometimes he does. But that's not the pattern. The pattern is he works through people. Someone has to go to them. Someone has to make disciples. Someone has to mentor people. Someone has to follow people up. Someone has to be kind to people. Someone has to make people welcome. Someone has to stretch out. Who is that someone? Or oh, it's the other guy. Must be. No, it isn't the other guy. It's you. Stop making excuses. In Luke 14, let's have a look at Luke 14. Luke chapter 14. That's what he says. It says, uh, and it applies to this because it's the same kind of behavior. It says, uh, <coughs> he told a parable, Luke chapter 14. We look at it down to verse 18. And uh, it said, uh, they were invited to come into the feast. He sent the servant out to invite people to participate, like I'm inviting you to participate. And notice what happened. Their response was, they all with one accord began to make excuses. Don't you love that? It's nothing new about excuses. The first said, I bought a piece of ground. I need to go and look at it. I've got a building project. So he asked to be excused. Another said, well, I've got five yoke of oxen. I'm going to test them. I ask you to be excused. Another said, oh, well, I'm married. I've got a wife. I've got kids to look after. Please excuse me. You know that old song we sing? I cannot come to the banquet. Don't bother me now. You know, I've married a wife and bought me a cow. You know, it's like, it's, I have fields and commitments. I cannot come. The bottom line is, I can't come. And there's some good reasons. There are really good reasons why you can't. And that's what an excuse is. An excuse is a reason to avoid responsibility. An excuse is an attempt to stop blame forming on us. An excuse is a way of getting out, of facing consequences, and not doing what we're supposed to do. How many know kids make excuses? Man, have you heard those excuses? Oh, my goodness. Excuse after excuse after excuse. And we make them. We give a reason why we couldn't do it or didn't want to do it. It's an excuse, but it doesn't cut it with God. Excuses don't cut it with God. I can show you that because he just won't listen to your excuses. Let's have a look. I'll show you, I'll show you how he didn't listen. See? Uh, you have a look in, uh, say, for example, uh, you look in, Mo in Exodus chapter 3. Here's a classic one. Exodus chapter 3. Now, I want to show you something in Exodus chapter 3. It relates very directly to us. And so Moses has an encounter with God. We love encounters with God. I love encounters with God. I had a fresh one this morning. I love it. And so he had an encounter with God. Now, notice what God says in verse 7. The Lord said, I have seen the oppression of my people in Egypt. I have seen people in Hastings and Flaxmere and Havelock and Napier and heard 
that they are in bondage. I've heard their cry because of the suffering they're going through. I know their sufferings. So isn't that great? God's saying, I have seen the oppression of families, young girls abused, young boys abused, of broken marriages, of, of catastrophic situations happening. I have seen it all. Nothing has escaped me. And he said, not only that, I've not only seen what's going on in the city, I have heard people crying. You haven't heard them crying. I have heard them crying. I've heard the young child crying when they hear their father and mother arguing. I hear when there's violence in the home, the cries of the young child, the young girl who's being molested, the cry in secret. I have heard their cries. I have known their sorrows. So when we come and relate to God, you've got to know this. God is listening to what's going on in homes all over our community. God's listening to the sorrows, the disappointments, the failures, the betrayals, the breakups, the heartaches. God is hearing and seeing it all and knows it all. So what does God say? I know what I'll do. I will come down and deliver them. When God sees the suffering of people, his heart as a father is to come and rescue them. But notice what he says then. He says, I will come down. Now, what we would love is if God just did it all. We would like him just to do that. That would be nice. He would just come down and wave his hand. It would be all over. And so what instead, this is what he said. Notice he's in verse 8. I've come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians. And then verse 10. Come now, I'm going to send you that you can bring them out. Now, notice, notice what happens here. God sees the desperate need. Here's the cries of the hearts, the cries of people, and he says, I am moved by their suffering. I will come down and do something about it. So how does he do it? Does he step down, move into that home, boof, gets that abuse? No, he doesn't do that. He says, you will go. You will go. You will go. You will go. When God wants to intervene in the earth, he chooses a man and says, I will go through you. You will go as my representative. What I want to do, you will go and do it. And so what does Moses respond like? <laughs> you think he'd be very excited. And he's not excited at all. He's full of discouragement, full of dismay. He says, well, who am I? Who am I? I don't know. Who am I? Who am I? I'm nothing. And so God keeps arguing with him or, or reasoning with him. And every time uh, he comes up with another excuse, he just keeps coming up with excuses over and over and over again in, in chapter 4. And verse 13, notice what it says there. Finally, this is what he comes up with. He says, because everything he comes up with, God says, I'll, I'll fix that. I'll sort that. Don't worry. I got it covered. He said, I got you covered. He said, I can't speak. It's okay. I got that covered too. He said, I don't know what to say. It's okay. I got that covered as well. He said, well, they'll say, well, who is, who is the God? I'm saying, okay, I got that covered. This is who I am. Jeez. And then finally, at the end, it comes out like this. Oh, verse 13, uh, he said, my Lord, please send by the hand of someone else that you may send. So what he's saying, in other words, it's a fancy way of saying, I don't want to go. You send someone else. I've given you every reason why I can't do it. Now, send someone else. And I was very upset with him over that, but he ended up going anyway. He said, well, I'll send you someone to be your mouthpiece. I'll put someone else in the, in the priest's house instead of you, but you are going. <laughs> because before Moses was ever born, this is what God intended for him. You understand? Before you were born, God intended great things for you to accomplish. Maybe the world won't know about them, but some person you've impacted will. You changed their life. You spent time with them when they needed help. They, you comforted them when they were in pain. You visited them when they were in distress. You helped them financially. Whatever it is, you influenced their life. God says, I want to help them. I will send you. So don't come up with your excuses. Don't say, well, I, 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 I got this and that. I just, just bought a piece of land. I got a project. I'm pretty busy. Oh, no, no. I, got, I just got married. I got kids. Oh, it's just too much. I can't do it. But that's the kind of stuff that goes on. And all of those are reasons but not excuses. It's because of a lack of priority, putting first God's interest so we can enjoy his blessing and have other things come together. Here's another example found in Jeremiah chapter 1. Oh, I love this one in Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 1. And uh, God's speaking to Jeremiah. He says, mate, I've got a plan for you. Have I got a plan for you? 
That's virtually what he's saying. Yeah, I've really got a plan for you because Jeremiah's in a state, the nation's in a state, and God wants to do something for the nation, wants to give a message of hope to the nation. And so he says in verse 5, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I made up my mind and set you in place. You'd be a prophet to nations. And I said, ah, oh, ah, oh, don't uh, speak to the hand. I, I can't talk. I'm too young. Too young. So we heard all, we're starting to hear all the excuses now. And I tell you, as you look through the Bible, you find there's a lot of excuses. And some disqualified people, and others, God wouldn't listen. God said to, to Jeremiah, listen, Jeremiah, this is not some last-minute thing I came up for you. This is my whole purpose for making you into this earth. You would become a prophet. I've already designed you for this. So you may be in electronics, God designed you for that. You may be in farming, God designed you for that. Whatever it is God designed you for, God thought about it before, put you in here. Don't make excuses. Oh, my background. Oh, I didn't get the education. I didn't get this. I didn't get that. Listen, God wants to work through you. God says, don't say, I'm too young. Don't say, I'm too young. What a contrast. Like Isaiah, when Isaiah heard the heart of God, he said, oh, here am I. Send me. So, so don't use the excuse, I'm too young. You're not too young. Most of the people in the Bible God used were young people. Jeremiah was young. Daniel was young. The apostles were all young. All young men. Now's your time to serve God. Now's the time to be available to God. Now what about all these old baby boomers? Got this thing in your mind, well, I've done my dash and I can t sit back, let the young fellas do it. What a crock. That is just nonsense. I tell you what the truth is. Your clock is running out. You need to be busy while you still can. Be busy serving God. Busy mentoring the next generation. Busy investing in the work of the kingdom. Don't you just get out there and playing bowls. What kind of life is that? Playing bowls. For goodness sake, you were born for more than that. You were born for much more than that. Get involved. Get engaged. Don't say we're too old. Say, man, I need a new assignment. We need to be excited and passionate. I've found when people, if you, get, if you stop getting a goal and a vision to do something, you get old and get, you get creaky and problems, you get sick. You die early. I've seen it. Danny Vick, the farmers, they come off the farm, they die within a few years. Why? Because they've got nothing to do. You need to be fired again. Fired again. Break them all. Don't be like all those other people, self-centered, just entitled. They sit back and look after me. What nonsense. It's an ungodly mindset needs confronting. We're called to do something with our life. Use the gifts. Use the time. Use the resources to extend the kingdom of God. Now, what if you just got married? Oh, well, I'm just married now. I'm, man, I've got a hard time, you know. Just, now, listen, don't use that as an excuse. Put God first and the marriage things come together. Well, I got children. Well, yeah, we had children too. We took them along to meetings. And what do they get? They get to love the thing, the presence of God. Listen, my granddaughter today said, Nana, I need a watch. And so she got, found her a watch and got the watch. A few minutes later, she came back and she'd wound the watch forward 15 minutes and said, Nana, it's time to go to church. I need to be there for kids' church. I said, what time you got to be there? She said, 8 o'clock. I said, really? Really? I don't even think, I don't even think Brett will be there. That, that, that Mr. Brett will be there. I said, probably about 9 o'clock. Is that right? Said, well, I've got to get there. I've got to get there. But you understand, by being brought into the environment, the passion for God is in the heart. You, you, you keep them away and entertain all this kind of stuff. You lose them. And then you don't just lose them, you lose your legacy. You lose the next generation as well because they marry the wrong people. And then they end up in a mess and the grandchildren are a mess. And you have sorrows instead of delight. I just delighted to hear such a stunt. That is just, oh, you're awesome. Isn't that something else? Come on. Don't make excuses for serving God. Don't make excuses. God wants to send you. And what's required? Here's another one. We can use prayer as the excuse. Well, I'm praying. Well, Jesus prayed, and you have to pray. To have a strong life of the supernatural, we must be strong people of prayer. 
Now, the disciples wanted to stay in that place of experience and encounter. And Jesus said, no, I want you to come with me. Come back to where there are people in need. I plan to commission you to go to them. There's some people that will only be reached if you reach them. There's some people that will only be saved if you take it on your heart to pray for them, bring them before the throne of grace, and then find a way to reach them and show kindness to them and find a need and pray for the power of God to touch their life. We're all called to this. We're all called to this. Commit to it. Present your body every day. God, today, I present my body. That's how I live and express in the earth. I present my body a living sacrifice to represent you today. To smile. So you don't look a mean, sour old person. Carry the joy of the Lord. Decide to be available. God, I'm available. Available means when God says now. And I found when he says now, you don't want to because there's something else you're doing. Available means whenever God says, I need you to talk to that one, help that one, you say yes. I need you to give to that one. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's a commitment. It's an availability. And it's a surrender. Yes, sir. It's what I'm called to be and to do, to represent you. Yes, sir. I'll do it. God will use you. He uses people you don't think. He uses you. It's not because they're clever. It's not because they have great giftings. It's not because they had a great education. It's none of those things. It's because in their heart, they say, God, I'm available. I'm committed to you to make your name famous, to extend your kingdom today. Bring people into my life that need what I can give them. And when you do, I'll stop and minister to them. I feel His presence coming right now. When Moses made all those excuses, basically he was discouraged. He was discouraged. He'd had a lot of failure. It seemed like life had passed him by. And at the age of 80, God says, now Moses, I plan to do something about this big problem and I plan to do it through you. So if you're 60 and above, you're still ready to be used. If you're young, you're ready to be used. But I want to, I just felt God just speaking to my heart today that there are people who have experienced discouragement, setbacks, and you drew back from being available. You drew back from expressing the life of God and ministering to people. And God's saying, today I want to heal your broken heart and I want to empower you with fresh fire again. If that's you, why don't we all stand up? Make your way to the front right now. I can feel His presence here. I feel His presence coming. He wants to heal the broken hearted. He wants to heal the broken heart. He wants to take away the discouragement. He thought his life was washed up. Everything was over. He was so bitterly disappointed with how it all worked out that even when God spoke to him, he fought against it. But God said, son, I haven't forgotten my call. This is your day. Just say yes and I'll help you do all the rest. I need you to be available. I need you to commit to be an extension of me. If you'll do it, there's people waiting for you to come. I wonder in your part of the community who's waiting for you to come, waiting for you to stand up inside and begin to build a strong prayer life, build intimacy, begin to spend time growing in God. And then as you go out day by day saying, God, here I am, I am willing. Why don't you come right now? Today, if you're brokenhearted, you've got disappointments, discouragement, you say, God, I need you to touch me and heal me. I want to be available again once more. I lost my way somewhere, but today, Lord, I want to freshly meet with you. There are other people today and you felt God challenge you and you say, God, I want to commit to being an extension of your life. I want to commit to being used by you. I'm available. I want to be available every day to be used. I choose today to present myself to you. Why don't you come to 
do. Why don't you come to and say, God, I lift my hands in surrender. I lift my hands. I want to grow in the supernatural lifestyle. I want to grow in compassion. I want to grow in experiencing the power of God. I want to grow in the anointing of the Holy Spirit. I want to grow. I'm going to stretch out and pray for people. I'm going to stretch out and share. I'm going to stretch out and help people. I'm going to visit someone. I've had them on my heart all week. I'm going to call them and visit them. I'm going to do what I haven't done before. I'm going to break out of that zone I've lived in, I've been comfortable in. I want to serve you. God, touch me today. Come on, come, come, come today. If you're an older person, baby boomer, over 60, and perhaps you know you've just slackened off and retired, and you say, man, oh man, I, I'm just rusting out here spiritually. God, today I feel you talking to me. I want to respond. Would you come? Would you come? Come lift your hands to the Lord right now.